Hello once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And we welcome you to the latest in our series of online programs. This week it is time for another installment of Ask the Expert. Today, we're gonna to talk about the process of researching artifacts that can be used in exhibits. And joining uh, us is someone who has become a familiar face and voice on this program, Tom Schieber. Uh, senior curator has been with the Hall of Fame going back to the late 1990s. Tom will talk about um, some of the pitfalls that can be faced in trying to research artifacts, some of the difficulties in finding artifacts that are appropriate to fit the theme of an exhibit, uh, and some of the different people that are involved in uh, this research process. Uh, we're all glad that you could uh, join us today. Glad that Tom Schieber could join us uh, as well from his home in nearby Milford, New York. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. You, you mentioned that I've been around since the late 1990s. I feel like I'm an artifact that someone should research. It won't be easy though. I'm so old. <laughs> That's right. Just for those who don't know, Tom actually started as our webmaster a long time ago. This was not long after the Hall of Fame first uh, developed a website. It's hard to believe there was ever a time when museums and places like the Hall of Fame did not have websites. But I remember when I first started here, the website was uh, really in its uh, very early stages. And Tom was uh, one of the early people that helped get it off the ground, then made the shift over to uh, the curatorial department and has been working there ever since. So Tom, uh, you put together a presentation today about this process of researching artifacts. And it's interesting, uh, there is a research department here at the Hall of Fame, but you guys in curatorial do an awful lot of research yourself. What are some of the reasons that you have to research artifacts that are in our collection? Um, great question. Um, yeah, and, and our research department um, de definitely does a lot of research and actually we, we utilize them. The curatorial department utilizes uh, the research department and say, hey, can you help me with this problem? Um, but we also do our own research as well. And, um, you know, the heart of a museum is, is its artifacts. And we've talked about in, in some of our past um, Zoom events, Bruce, that, you know, telling stories through artifacts is what we do as curators. Um, but we have to understand those artifacts. And it's not often, it's not actually, I, I thought I misspoke, but it's true. It's not often that we, we really do understand our artifacts. Um, so um, we research them to better understand what that object really is. And sometimes it's what it is not uh, is just as important. Um, we want to understand, understand the history of the object and what it can teach us about baseball history or about history in general, if it goes beyond baseball sometimes. Um, and when it gets right down to being a curator and, and using it in an exhibit, what stories can an object help us tell? And sometimes it works the other way around and you hinted at it, that sometimes we don't know what artifact we want um, actually, most of the time, we don't know what artifact we want, we want. We know what the story is. And so now we have to think about, well, what's going to help tell the story? And we have to think about it in creative ways. And to complicate matters, we have 40,000 plus artifacts in the collection. Bats, balls, gloves, uniforms, shoes, even artifacts that are not directly connected to baseball, like uh, watch fobs, uh, pins, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, many, many artifacts to keep track of. And a lot of these artifacts came in before any of us were working here. And this is not meant to, you know, disparage anybody who worked here back in the, you know, 1940s and 50s. But museum processes have changed uh, since then. Record keeping back then in general was probably not as good at museums as it is today. So in some cases, we don't have a lot of written information about the artifacts, and that kind of puts the onus on you guys. Bruce, you, you, you're absolutely right. And I, I tell people this all the time when, we, when we're talking about researching artifacts, and, um, and I say, you know, I, I do a better job now than I did 10 years ago, and 10 years from now, I'll do a better job than I'm doing right now. Um, it, it, it really it continues to improve. Um, you, you mentioned the website. So, you know, when I started at the Hall of Fame to work on the website, it was nowhere near as robust and as rich with information as it is now. And boy, as I go through the presentation today, you're going to see so much of what I, what, what I was able to determine about these artifacts came through research on the web. Now, there's no substitute for 
for handling an object and looking it over never will be a substitute for that. Um, and I discover all sorts of things by just really looking physically at the object. Yeah. But all these other tools, and who knows what tools we're going to have 10 years from now. I can't even imagine what, what it might be. But um, boy, we've come a long way. And uh, so you, you're right. Nothing against the people that were um, looking into these objects 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, it just, it's, it's more and more rich what you can learn. Um, not necessarily easier, but um, there's just more opportunities to find information. Yeah, and you also have to think back to an era when computerization was not really the name of the game at museums. Uh, that, you know, I think computers really started to be used pretty heavily here in the 1980s and 90s, and even then, not to the extent that they are today. Now, Tom, you mentioned earlier uh, your department, Curatorial, is involved in research. Uh, the research department with Bill Francis, Cassidy Lent, Jim Gates, they're involved. Any other departments involved in research here? Sure. I mean, so uh, um, the collection staff, the people that actually are tasked with taking care of organizing uh, the, the objects, they do research. Um, we constantly talk with them. If I find something out, I try to keep them informed, vice versa. Um, our PR staff, our publication staff, when they're working on articles, uh, and then, of course, the public. Uh, the public is certainly, we love to help them out. They can come to our library, uh, learn more about the hours and how to do that on our website. But uh, everybody's involved. Some people are more than others. So, you know, yeah, curatorial and collection staff is going to be the ones that are going to be researching artifacts the most. But, uh, yeah, everybody does it. Now, for today's program, you have selected five different artifacts. And you're going to go through the process of how each of these artifacts has uh, hopefully been tailored or can be tailored to fit a particular exhibit theme. Now, the first one that you have is a relatively recent artifact. It's from a game that happened just over two years ago involving the St. Louis Cardinals, Matt Carpenter, and a five-hit day when he collected two doubles, three home runs, seven home runs. And here we have the bat that Matt Carpenter used that day. Uh, tell us the story here. Right, and you, you know, you, you bring up an, another interesting point, which is what I, I'll go over some of the research. I, I'm not gonna, for each artifact, there's lots of research going on. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight some of the more interesting ones. So uh, listen, sometimes when we're researching an artifact, it's pretty straightforward and it's not surprising. You gotta go through the, you gotta do it rigorously, but um, there's a lot of times when the story is not particularly exciting, the research story, or interesting. Uh, hopefully I've got some, some that have a little bit of interest. This one is a little bit more straightforward because, um, yeah, so Matt Carpenter had a, 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 a you know, a record tying game uh, back in July 20th, 2018, when he hit five, he had five extra base hits in a game, and that tied a record. Um, and uh, so a request was made um, for that bat. Uh, that he used, and um, thankfully, and this is, as you know, Bruce, we, we it's never a, a tell, we always ask. Um, we are not part of Major League Baseball, so we, get, we don't get these things automatically. We, we ask Matt Carpenter and the Cardinals, would they be willing to donate an object, just like fans donating objects? And happily, they, they were, and uh, happily, Matt was. You know, a tough ask is a bat that's, that's doing well, because ballplayers if a bat's doing well, really well, they're not going to give up the bat. Why would I give up a bat when there's when I'm doing really well with it? Um, and it's not even just a superstition thing. It may be, in fact, this is just a perfect bat for me. I'm just really doing well with it, and it's the perfect weight, the perfect whatever. So what's interesting about this was that when we requested the bat, they said yes. And Matt said yes, I'd be happy to donate it. Uh, but not right now, <laughs> as, as is often the case. And we're totally cool with that. We get it. So um, about a little over a week after he set this, um, he tied this record, uh, the bat came and, um, but it came broken. As you can see in this picture, it's broken. Um, well, obviously it wasn't broken that, well, it wasn't broken on the day that he had those, those five extra base hits. Um, and actually there is, and it's hard to see on here, but uh, can you see my mouse once I pass it over here, Bruce? Is that? Yes. Cool. So right here is a little hologram, Major League Baseball authentication hologram, which has a, a, a number on it. And if you look it up online uh, through the web, 
Um, Let people tell know it's where, where it says DW5M Pro Model. Under there is the hologram Tom's talking about. Right. I'm trying to circle it here with my little arrow. And, um, and that's what they know about the bat at the time. And they have strict rules about what they can say about a bat uh, um, when, when it's authenticated. And all it said was it was used on July 28th, 2018, in his second at bat of the first inning, the Cardinals batted around. Well, July 28th is not the date that I was hoping to see. I wanted to see July 20th. Um, that doesn't mean that it wasn't used on July 20th. We just know that it was used on July 28th. It may have also been used on July 20th. And according to the Cardinals and their uh, um, the equipment manager at the time, or a guy named Ernie Moore, a great guy, and, and Matt, no, this is the bat that I used for like over a week, and including that five extra base hit game. That's great but I need to make sure I feel good about that. So I had to do some research and that's the kind of thing we'll, we'll do. So um, go to the next slide here and you'll see what part of my research was looking at watching um, Matt Carpenter's at bats during the game in question, July 20. Um, I actually looked at the July 28th second at bat. And in fact, he did break his bat in that uh, at bat. So that jived with what the hologram claimed. Um, but um, I compared the bat, as you can see, there's a freeze frame from the sixth inning. Um, and as you can see on the little bug at the bottom, uh, they, the, the uh, uh, sports, uh, NBC Sports Chicago said he's a four for four. So he was just about to get his fifth extra base hit. Um, and here he is holding the bat. And so I compared it and, um, with the bat uh, in, that was sent to us. I tried to position it similarly. And I looked for features that were similar. Now, one thing that's important to remember is, remember the bat came to us well over a week after the event occurred that we were trying to document. So obviously things can change. Um, it's getting used and there's gonna be new nicks and marks and changes. So I didn't expect to see something that was identical to what, um, let's for example, this at bat. But I did see a number of things that did match up. So for example, you can see there's this MLB logo upside down here, mm -hmm. and that's it right here. So I know, I know I've got it positioned correctly, but you can see there's a little bit of a triangle of open area underneath this uh, tape that's used to give him a good grip. And that triangle is essentially in a random spot, but it's in the exact same spot as we would see here. So that matched well. And there's a little smudge mark right here. It's actually not a smudge, it's a little uh, dent in the wood. Obviously this, you can see the break, that's not the situation that, right, with Matt Carpenter on July 20th. But that, that blemish in the wood, you can, if you look very closely, I'm, I'm not sure people are gonna see this very easily in our Zoom chat, but there is a, a blemish there. Mm -hmm. We move further up and you can see a dark spot here. This is actually an intentional ink mark that all bat companies that, you, that create maple bats must put on a bat for it to be legal to use in major league games. It has to do with testing uh, the grain and making sure the grain is uh, um, straight enough that it will not cause a dangerous or minimize the chance for a dangerous break. Uh, we can talk, that's a whole other episode to talk about that. But it's in the exact same spot relation, in relation to this, the uh, uh, MLB logo. And even portions of this very thick pine tar that Matt uses, this unique sort of fingerprinting, is similar where there's an open gap right here and that's this yeah. open gap right here. Now that's gonna change because he's gonna change the pine tar, little, a little bit here and there. But you know what, when you have all of these little features lining up, if, I, if it was just one of them, that could be a coincidence. But the fact that there's so many that are similar, and this is just a few, and I haven't even shown you the other sides of the bat or the end of the bat, that's the kind of thing we do to make sure, yeah, this is exactly what we thought it was. And now I feel good writing a label and telling people this is the bat Matt, Matt Carpenter used to do X, Y, and Z. And by the way, I looked at all five at bats because I wanted to make sure he didn't change it, change bats, which you would guess he wouldn't because he's hot with a bat, but you know, who knows? So this is a typical case of photo matching an artifact when it comes in. In a broader sense, something interesting too, um, I don't see a lot of Marucci bats in the major leagues. Is that is that becoming a more common brand that you're aware of? Yeah, absolutely. So Marucci is a, a, a pretty well used uh, bat in the majors. There's more diversity in baseball bats today than uh, I, my guess is ever. Um, you know, it used to be basically Rawlings and Louisville Slugger, maybe a couple other ones. 
there's uh, many, many different models of bats. And I like that because I think it's fun to see the different bats. I've, I, mm. You know, I didn't used to be a bat guy, but once I became a curator here and was looking at bats all the time, um, I really got to like uh, the different styles and the different looks of them um, and how they've changed over time. Yeah, but that's yeah. a yeah, Marucci maple bat that, that he's got there. The two-tone bat is something that I don't really remember when I first started watching baseball in the early 70s. And now you see more and more of, of these kinds of bats and Carpenter using that here. Let's go back to the crack in the handle. Yeah. Um, obviously, he was a little more willing to give up the bat after it cracked and he couldn't use it in games anymore. Yeah. Um, but that crack in the bat, that probably creates some problems for you in terms of just handling it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's a very good call. And, and in fact, sometimes we get bats that are much more cracked than this. So this bat came, it was still pretty stable. You got to be careful. You don't want the crack to get any worse. And obviously a, a disaster can occur if it cracks in half. That's, a, that's not good. We have gotten bats that are in multiple pieces that, can, that come to us. Mm -hmm. um, so when, you know, I root for things a little bit differently now that I'm a curator. So when an event happens, uh, once, once, uh, once Matt said, yeah, I'll send you the bat once it's, when it dies, uh, I'm like, oh, please don't die in a horrific manner where it's in multiple pieces. That's going to be not as fun to display. It's going to be harder to, to piece together, et cetera, et cetera. But it's funny you should, by, by the way, mention the two-tone bats or the, what are called full dip bats, bats where the entire thing has a, a stain to it. Uh, once again, I root for these bats that are at least like mats or are completely unstained because another great way to ID a bat is to look at very particular grain patterns. Now that's really like a fingerprint, right? Yeah. What that's missing when you have a bat that's completely lacquered or completely stained, and it makes, the, makes it more difficult and more of a challenge. Uh, so I love it and I root for the guys uh, who use unstained bats because it actually makes it a lot more straightforward. Uh, I don't mind the challenge, but it makes it a lot more straightforward to, um, to nail that this is exactly the bat that I, that I thought it was. So we've established there's no question that it's the same bat, it's the correct mm -hmm. bat. Uh, you mentioned earlier this was tying a record, five extra base hits in regulation nine inning game. Tom, do you recall who had the original record? Well, it's yeah, it's actually a bunch of people. I mean, I think okay. it's like 13 or 14 people now. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, it was uh, tied again this year by Alex Dickerson of the, of the Giants in, in wow. literally just over a month ago. Um, and uh, you know, with offense going as crazy and especially power uh, numbers going as crazy as they have been for the last, whatever you want to say, 30 years, something like that. Um, as you might expect, I think it's over half of these guys have happened in the last 20 years, but um, some of them were in the 19th century. I mean, you've got a guy like Larry Twitchell, who's actually a pitcher, uh, did it in 1889. Uh, George Gore uh, did it in 1885. But then you get guys like Steve Garvey has done it. Willie Stargell did it. Stargell shouldn't be too much of a surprise, right? Yeah. Um, and then modern guys like uh, uh, Chris, Chris Bryant done it. Um, uh, Joe Adcock did it in, in 1954. I think that was the, the same day he had, I think it was the four homers and he had a double or something like that. So that was also a four homer game. Uh, Josh Hamilton's four homer game was also had a fifth hit, which was an extra base hit. So Now this bat is part of the Your Team Today exhibit. Right. So it is on display. For those, Tom, not familiar with Your Team Today, what exactly is that? Yeah, if you go to our third floor, it's an exhibit where we have um, what looks like 30 very sort of small lockers um, that one for each major league team that's currently playing. And inside each locker is, you know, anywhere from eight to a, a dozen artifacts related to that team. Um, highlights from the last um, uh, 10 to 12 years, something like that. Not necessarily the guys that are with the club now. Players move around. We're not, we can't move the artifacts around that easily. But highlights from uh, that team's a very recent history. And so um, this bat is in the Cardinals uh, locker. And actually all the artifacts I'll be talking about um, are ones that you can see if you come to the museum. All right, next up, we're gonna have an artifact that is from a much different time period, going way, way back. And this is more of an indirect connection. Uh, the, the further you go back in time, it is sometimes difficult to create these connections as you're able to do with a, a, a current contemporary player like Matt Carpenter. But here we're gonna to try to find an artifact to tell the story of a Hall of Famer, Hugh Duffy, who played in the 19th century. And in 1894, he had an incredible year. He batted 440, 
and that is a single season record for the post-1876 era. Now, we don't have two guppies with that. We had to go in a different direction. So tell us about that, Tom. Right. So uh, as you noted, the earlier you go, the less likely it is that we're going to have something from a particular event because um, especially since, you know, we didn't open our doors until the mid 1930s. And so requesting artifacts was not even a possibility be before that in terms of, hey, you did this, uh, this just happened yesterday. Could, would you mind sending something to us, donating something to us? So sometimes you luck out and we, we do have objects that are from particular events and sometimes you don't and you have to think sort of creatively. Um, we have a lot of databases that we can use, and I could search for Hugh Duffy, and I did. Um, and I got a certain number of things that came up, um, a very nice trophy that he was awarded just in the turn of the century, a couple other objects, but none of them were really as directly related to this uh, event that, that I needed. I really wanted something that was a little bit more directly related to this event. Odds are not, not easy uh, to do that. So um, rather than searching for Hugh Duffy, I had to go about a different way. And what I decided to do, let's take a look at a picture of Hugh. That's, there's Hugh Duffy. Um, and I even considered at one point that this cabinet card might do the job if it was from 1894, but it's not from 1894. And I really wanted something from that season. But I would take anything from the season because it's a season record. It's not a single day event. So what I did was I thought, well, what if we have a scorecard from that season? And we have a wonderful scorecard collection and really very impressive for 19th century as well. Um, but once again, it's not, it's not uh, so detailed that I can type in the name Hugh Duffy and every scorecard with Hugh Duffy's name will come up. That would be great, but that's not the situation we're in. So I had to do it a, a little bit different. I said, well, I know Hugh Duffy played for Boston in 1894. Do we have any Boston scorecards from around that era? Because sometimes we don't even know the year. Um, so I looked and I found a number of scorecards and I was able to find this scorecard here um, and was able to date it. Um, so first of all, it's a scorecard from New York. It's New York against Boston. So that's the Giants against the so-called Bean Eaters, but they were mostly called the Bostons at, the, at this era. And I noticed at the bottom, and it's going to be very hard to see, I, I can even having trouble seeing on my big screen, um, the names of the pitchers, one, one of two pitchers. One of them is Amos Rusi, who's a very famous pitcher. Another one is a guy named Hyler Westervelt, who is not a famous guy. As a matter of fact, he only played one year in the majors, and that year was, happily, 1894. So I very quickly was able to assess that this is a game from 1894 between New York and Boston because Hyler Westervelt is listed uh, as being with the Giants. Um, well, it's very rudimentary scorekeeping. They, there were people at this time who were keeping very good score, but whoever kept this scorecard basically was numbering the out. So uh, one would mean the first out, two would be a thir second out, three is a third. A dash meant something else happened. And a dot, you can see a little dot here, Bruce, and a dot here. <laughs> Those mean runs, and that's actually a holdover from cricket. Uh, um, cricket was a, uh, we, we'd use dots to determine runs. But anyway, we can see how many runs are scored. It looks like the Giants scored five runs, and the um, uh, Boston's only scored two, so the score is five to two in favor of the Giants. And I looked it up, and there's only one five to two game in 1894 between the Giants and Boston. Right. And that was May 5th, 1894, and actually, uh, there's Tyler Westervelt right, right there. And this is a little clipping of that game where it was actually a very well attended game. It was a Saturday game, no Sunday games in uh, New York at that time. Uh, those were blue laws. You were not allowed to do that. But they got big weekend uh, attendance. 15,000 was a big deal at that time. And um, and it actually mentioned Tyler Westervelt did very well. And, and he they uh, uh, it says... Uh, Giants beat the champions. You got to remember that in 1894, Boston had won the nationally pennant three years in a row. This is their, they won in 92, 93, and 94. This is a great team. Mm -hmm. And uh, New York was a little, it was actually struggling a little bit. And so this was a nice big win from a basically an unknown pitcher, even at that time, Tyler Westerfeld. He didn't amount to, this was kind of his peak, quite frankly. This game was one of his uh, peaks. Well, so then I look at Hugh Duffy, and here's uh, Hugh Duffy right, in the uh, bat and third. And I thought, well, it's great. And now, now I've got a game. Um, then maybe I can use this as a, an artifact through which to tell the story of this great season. And then I noticed that um, uh, 
if you look at the box score in combination with this, this score, I don't have the box score up here. He went 0 for 3. And I thought, oh, I wanted him to, I wanted him to go for 3 for 3 or 4 for 4, right? He's such a great batter. And then I realized, wait a second, this is even rarer <laughs> than, than a, a game with a hit. As a matter of fact, I looked it up. I did the math. Hugh Duffy played 125 games that year. Uh, this was a, at this time, the National League had 132 game schedule. So he, picked, he was, you know, just missed a couple of games. Yeah. And Duffy only went hitless, as you might guess, a very few times. He only went hitless 19 times. So that's like 15% of his games, he went hitless. This, is a, this scorecard is a real rarity. He didn't get a hit. <laughs> so that was very impressive, what Tyler Westerdahl did. Not only did he beat, the, beat Boston, but he held uh, Hugh Duffy hitless. Um, and when you think about it, you know, uh, I looked into it, you know, Ted Williams, the last guy to hit over 400 uh, in, a, in a major league season for a, a full, you know, playing enough to qualify for the batting title. Uh, he went hitless 30 times in 143 games. That's over 20% of the games. This guy, Hugh Duffy, did it in only 15% of the games. So it was very impressive. But I mean, he batted 440. What's the, not so surprising. So here we had to find an artifact that was not going to be obvious. And, but as it turns out, it could tell a good story. And I could tell the story of a great season through the scorecard, even though he didn't have a good day. Tom, it's interesting to me that the names in the lineup are typewritten. Yeah. So I guess when you bought a scorecard back then, they actually, they pre-printed the lineup. Is that how it worked? They did. And actually, Bruce, if you take a look, for example, right here at the bottom of the lineup for Boston, they have two guys listed as catcher and two guys listed as pitcher. And sometimes they'd cross it off. So you, the scorekeeper would say, oh yeah, uh, that, this guy didn't catch, it's a different guy. Or they cross off who was the pitcher. Um, 1894, you, you don't have, you know, nowadays it's regular to have seven or eight guys pitching every game. Yeah. Um, so that would be an impossibility. And when I was going up, you, you were going up, usually your, if it was pre-printed, the one thing that wasn't pre-printed was the, the pitcher's spot in the lineup. Remember when they used to bat? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you just write that in because at the beginning of the game, they'd announce, oh, it's, so-and-so is going to pitch. Uh, Nolan Ryan's going to pitch. You can type in, you know, write in Nolan Ryan's thing. But um, not only that, but also the lineups didn't change as much. Nevertheless, you do find scorecards where things are crossed out. Um, you'd have fewer in-game changes at that time as well. Now they're changing them all the time. Um, but they did, uh, by the 1890s, they actually did have small printing presses at some of the ballparks, they were already doing this. Some, some of them were, were done offsite, but some of them were actually done at the ballpark as well. Interesting uh, looking at this uh, scorecard, some of the advertising, we've got yeah. porous plaster, uh, cigarettes, cigars, uh, something called prompt printing. Yeah, let's uh, go back here, there you go, yeah. Emerson shoes. Yeah, notice that so many of these advertisements are geared to at this time, 1890s, a more traditional male audience. Yes. And if you read about the, um, the uh, games, but especially if you look at photos well into the 20th century, and you can tell which, you see a photo and you can see the crowd, you can see this vast majority are men. Um, it really wasn't becoming a, ga a game in which you brought the family to until quite a ways into the 20th century, which isn't to say the kids didn't go to games. It just was not as uh, universal as it is now, where it's almost 50-50 male-female, certainly lots of kids. This is a good example of that. You'll also see that when it, when it comes to advertisements on outfield walls as well. They tend to be shaving or alcohol, which was less proper for women to be uh, drinking in the 1890s, certainly not done as much publicly. Um, a lot of things that are geared more towards men. Tom, do we know who filled out this scorecard? Um, you know what? I don't know who the donor is. I actually didn't uh, uh, refresh my memory of that. I know I looked into it when I did my original research because, as I mentioned earlier, I'm only telling you a little bit of the story. But that's an important thing to know. Let's say this was kept by uh, Hyler Westervelt's mom or dad, right? That's a neat. That would be a neat part of the story to tell. Um, or if, you know, so you never know where the story may, may change and we'll talk about some artifacts like that. You gotta do your digging and get the world as, as responsible as you want. You can't, you can't spend three months on one artifact, but you yeah. do a, a reasonable job. And sometimes 
that research will twist the way you think about that object or, or, or inform you a new way to tell this story. But as I recall, the, what I do recall was it was of non-impact in terms of the story that I was telling, who, that who had done it. Right. All right, very good. So we started with a, a recent player, Matt Carpenter. Now we've gone back 19th century to Hugh Duffy. Right. Uh, next up, we've got another uh, Hall of Famer. Unless you had, did you have something else to mention on this one? No, let's go to this, this okay. next one. All right, so next up, we have something that ties in to the career of a player that I'm sure everybody's familiar with, the great Lou Gehrig. And this one involved a mystery behind a silver trophy that I believe the Sporting News gave to Lou. Tell us about that, Tom. Right, so um, we have this wonderful um, uh, trophy that was donated to us by Eleanor Gehrig, Lou Gehrig's widow. And uh, she, in her will, willed an immense collection to us. Um, and, you know, and we actually have three separate uh, major donations that are Gehrig related, some other small ones, but Lou Gehrig donated a number of items to us. Lou Gehrig's mother donated a, num a, a number of items and um, uh, her name is Christine. And then Eleanor Gehrig did as well. So this came from Eleanor and um, uh, I needed an artifact to help tell the story of Lou Gehrig's consecutive game um, played streak that was broken over half a century later by um, Cal Ripken. And um, there wasn't something real specific. I mean, that's a record that took years to, to put together. And so um, I was uh, looking through records of what we had in the collection. And I came across this beautiful trophy. It's a silver trophy. It's quite large. Um, and I really especially love, if you take a look at the top, it's got, it's, it's very not baseball-y from, from here, you know, for the vast majority of it is a sort of celebratory and it says glory right here in the front. And at the top, there's a little uh, a flat area where you could put whatever image you wanted. The, the, um, this trophy was available for any purpose. They tailored it to baseball and they put an image of a batter, which makes sense. Um, they put an image of a right-handed batter, which is a little bit weird because <laughs> Gehrig was a lefty. So <laughs> that's a little funny, I thought. But anyway, um, he got this trophy and, and uh, this is a close-up of the base and you can see what it says. Presented by the Sporting News to Henry Louis Gehrig, first baseman, New York Yankees, for playing in most consecutive games beginning June 1, 1925, ending April 30, 1939, total of 2,130 games. So I thought, well, let me do some research on this. It's a, uh, it didn't seem like it was gonna be too much of a challenge. Um, clearly, I should look sometime around April 30th or later. And I was gonna look in the Sporting News because Sporting News gave it to Gehrig. You would think they'd publicize it. They spent some money on this. Um, at least that paper will publicize it. Uh, that's one of the reasons that they would give this, is it gives good copy. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't find any information. I'm thinking, why, why would they present this to Lou Gehrig right after his streak ends and not mention that they did this very nice thing? And I, I couldn't find anything. And I was scouring the paper. I even went a little bit early because maybe the date of the publication is, is not quite right, you know, or whatever. I couldn't find anything. And so then what you do is uh, you don't give up. <laughs> I widened my search and uh, I went well after 1939. Well, you know, maybe it happened, you know, the next couple of years before he passed away, found nothing. And then I thought, well, maybe there's something else going on. And I just did a really broad search. I said, forget putting a date on it. And this is using digitized online historic newspapers. Um, and I was changing my the word it was searching for or whatever. But um, finally, I did find reference to it. But I found reference to it in 1933, which was very confusing to me because I thought, how is it possible that they're referring to giving him this award in 1933 when he hasn't finished the uh, the record? I mean, how did, did they have a fortune teller who said, oh, he will end his record on April 30th and it will total 2,130? I mean, unless they had a, a fortune teller or a time machine, I didn't know how this was possible. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and actually, um, they didn't know, of course, they didn't know. Now, he received the award in St. Louis in a game against the Browns uh, from a representative of the Sporting News 
on August 17th, 1933, the day that he broke the old record, which was Everett Scott, who played in 1,307 consecutive games. So as it turned out, the 1,308th consecutive game, game that Gary Clayton was in St. Louis, and newspapers covered the story the next day. So you look in the newspaper of August 18th, 1933, and this is a clipping from, uh, as it turns out, this is the Gold Democrat in St. Louis, but you can see it says he topped the old mark of 1307, owned by Everett Scott, blah, blah, blah. Um, he was honored after the first inning being the recipient of a trophy from the Sporting News. And, um, and here is actually a photo of him getting this award in 1933. That's uh, the American League president, Will Herridge, who was on it. He was there for that event. And this is a guy named George Brands, who is a writer for the Sporting News. This is uh, uh, Joe Sewell, who actually had a record of, not a record, but he had a, a, a streak that ended a little bit earlier of 1,103 games. And that ended in 1930. So he had a, a pretty good long streak. Um, so obviously, this trophy that we're seeing here couldn't possibly have had those final dates in it. So what happened? Well, what happened is they gave him this award. And they didn't put the, the beginning or ending date or the total on the bottom. They said, when you're done with the record, when you finally stop, give us the, the trophy back. We'll put the final information on it, and then you'll have it. So that's what happened. And that's why we didn't find anything in 1939, because, the, it, one, it was kind of a non-story to talk about, oh, and Lou gave us back this trophy. Also, it was kind of a downer of a story, because Lou Gehrig was that streak ended for not great reasons, uh, being a diagnosed with ALS and then he ended his career, not just the streak. And so there's no mention of it when he sent it back to, to get it finished off. But if we take another look at it, by the way, you can see, if you look very closely, the writing at the bottom, the last two lines, the beginning and ending date and the total is a little bit different style, a little bit thinner yes. than what you see above. And, um, you know, I never would have noticed that, thought about that before until I kept on bumping into the fact that I can't find anything in 1939. And I bumped to it in 1933. So um, it yeah, changed you know, the story. You don't, you don't really see it at first, but now that you pointed out where it says Henry Lewis Garrick, first baseman, uh, that is kind of a, a bold font. Right. And then beginning June 1st, 1925, ending April 30th, that's um, not a bold font. It's a little bit smaller, not as highlighted as the other. So yeah, you did. You see the difference. Yeah. So you can see, this is a trophy that actually is very different. The trophy was really given for breaking Everett Scott's record, but ultimately it changed its meaning when they finally put the the final totals at the end. It's all about this incredible record. I mean, he went all, another 800 games or something like this. Yeah. yeah. So. You understand how, how we're now looking at this trophy in a different light, only because we did the research and actually the research took us in this wacky direction that we would never have expected. Tom, I'm curious if at any point you thought maybe this is a fake, you couldn't find any <laughs> verification. You thought maybe somebody had this made up, a fake sporting news trophy. Well, you know, sometimes it's in the back of my mind uh, about, about objects. And, and um, in this case, a couple things. One, it came from, from Eleanor. So uh, the odds are lower. You know, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but the odds are much lower. Um, and uh, I wasn't ready to go to that angle yet. <laughs> I, I want to do more digging, but it really just, um, you know, one of the weird things about this, Bruce, and it, it, it sounds like a cop-out, but it's not really a cop-out at all. I've been doing this a long time, and I got to say, doing research like this is, there's a lot of science to it, a lot of, a lot of hardcore factual fact-finding. And there's a lot of art to it as well. You get a real feeling for it. And I just can't explain it. It's, it has to do with experience. And um, it's, it's really hard to put a finger on. And, and uh, as a, my background's in science, and, and, uh, and, I, and I hate to admit it, but sometimes you just get a feeling about something. And I never got that feeling here. And as it turns out, it, everything matches up fine. We totally understand what's going on here. It is very legitimate. It is a sporting news trophy originally presented uh, 1933, and then revised, as Tom mentioned, right. with uh, the dates. Uh, that was added 1939, when Garrick Street came to an end. Uh, fascinating uh, piece of research there. Uh, next up, Tom, you have uh, not a three-dimensional artifact, but a photograph. And this is something from 
the Negro National League. I believe this would be the St. Louis Stars, if I'm not mistaken. What's the story here? So um, this is an uh, exhibit, uh, by the way, the one that we just saw, the uh, um, Gary uh, uh, Trophy is in our One for the Books exhibit about baseball records. So if you want to go upstairs, you can see it on the third floor. Um, this is an exhibit called Featuring America's Pastime that is now located uh, on our second floor. Right when you get to near the top of the steps, you can see it there. And um, it is an exhibit of uh, just really showing the breadth and depth of our fantastic photo collection. And this is just one of, of many photos that we chose for the exhibit. And, uh, you know, going into it, all we knew was this is um, an all black ball club. And, but what I learned was when you research, well, I had learned for a number of artifacts and objects and ephemera, sometimes by, by researching an artifact, you can get a lot, a little more specificity, you can better understand that, and actually new facets to the story pop up as well. And, and this one is, um, there's actually a lot of information to be had from this beautiful photograph. Um, obviously, first thing you, you, that's, that's patently clear is a daytime picture, and it's a, of an all-black ball club. And the first question I had was, where was this photo taken? And so I quickly um, zoomed in on some of these billboards in the background. So the billboards on the right here in the background, you can read and I'll blow it up for you. And it's one of them in particular says, Midwest National Bank and Trust Company, the bank of youth and energy, capital 1 million. And then you can see something at ninth and it's A-N-D and it, you know, it's so some sort of street with an A-N-D at ninth. Mm. So I looked into on a city directory, some city directories, I did some research online and was able to find out that um, this is the Midwest National Bank and Trust Company in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, the, first of all, in this entry, near the end, you can see Grand Avenue, Southwest Corner, 9th. So that's Grand at 9th. That's what they're talking about. And this is from a city directory from 1920 in Kansas City. So I thought, okay, that's good. And I also checked some of the others, other ones, but I just want to show this particular um, billboard. But everything was matching up to Kansas City, so that was fine. And as a matter of fact, if you look very carefully at the bottom, you see a name written at the bottom of the photo. It says photo by J.E. Miller slash KC for Kansas City. And uh, here's another part of the same city directory that talks about a guy named James E. Miller. And this is in the section of photographers. Here's the Gleaves Photograph Studio or Hicks and Connolly Studios. And he had a small entry under, under Photograph Studios, James E. Miller at 1622 East 18th Street. So I researched James Miller. And one thing I found out that was I thought was fascinating, and by the way, James Miller has done, a, or you see a lot of photos of Negro League uh, teams that have that J.E. Miller at the bottom. Um, he's taken a number of iconic photos of early Negro Leagues. So this is not a, a one-off thing. He's taken a number of photos. Turns out he's an African-American photographer based in Kansas City. And um, that address, 1622 East 18th, but one thing I always do whenever I see addresses, I try and see what's there now. And so um, I looked at an old fire insurance map back in, actually a little bit prior to 1920, and this is 18th Street. And this is 1622. You can see the, uh, the address there, 1622, and that matches James Miller, this is where he had his studio, on 1622 East 18th Street, near the corner of 18th and Vine, a very famous corner. But what I found really fascinating is this entire block here, that's where the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is today. Oh, wow. By coincidence. This is not like, oh, we need to, we're going to put the uh, museum here because a famous photographer took a lot of Negro Leagues photos there. This is a complete coincidence, which I just thought was fascinating and wonderful. Oh, again, a twist that you, you know, never would have gotten had I not done this research. Now, of course, the next question is, when was this photo taken? And if we zoom in on the scoreboard in the background, we can see the scoreboard. The scoreboards are wonderful things because they're little moments in time, usually, not always, but usually. Um, we can see a lot of information here. So for example, you can see a number of different teams that played one another. Um, here we have Annapolis, that's Indianapolis versus Kansas City. It's a partial score because some of the numbers are, have been taken down, but you can see the total 
was two to one. Okay. Also, we can see down here, Cincinnati played Brooklyn under the words national. That's a national league game. The Indianapolis, Kansas City, that's an American Association minor league game. Cincinnati, Brooklyn, once again, the numbers for the game are, are gone, or at least from what I can tell, except for the, tough, the final. This is a seven here for Cincinnati, and Brooklyn had nine. And then finally, um, there's the game that I was able to determine was what had just happened at the park here, St. Louis and NARCH, which is short for Monarchs, the Kansas City Monarchs, very famous team. There you see much of the score, uh, but it's not quite completed. And when did all three of these occur at the same time? Luckily, that's only going to happen once, you know, where there's a two to one game in the American Association between Indianapolis and Kansas City and Brooklyn beating Cincinnati nine to seven and Kansas City Monarchs being St. Louis a nationally, a Negro National League team, which actually was called the Giants. They were called the St. Louis Giants at that time. Okay. They beat them seven to five. That all happened all the same day. June 14, 1920. Wow, this is really old then. Huh. It is really old. As a matter of fact, what's really cool year about this is yeah. 19, June 14, that's just a couple of months. Actually, I, I think I think they started play either in April or maybe early May. That's the first year of the Negro National League, which was founded in Kansas City. Right. And one more thing I want to show you. Uh, so here's, a, this is a very poor reproduction. I apologize for that. But this is the box score. Uh, the line score, the, co the coverage and the line score of that Kansas City Monarchs versus St. Louis Giants game, seven to five. Ha ha, the locals won today. That was <laughs> and so there's your coverage of the, of, of the game. But once again, take a look at this picture. Where was this game played? Well, now, according to the box, the, the uh, count, it should be Association Park, which is the name of the ballpark before the more famous Muehlbach Park in Kansas City was used. 1920 would have been Association Park, but I wanted to make sure I got that right. So I looked at the, the buildings in the background. And look at this one in particular on the right side, and I'll blow it up for you. Right above this guy's heads, you see this, this building. Well, Association Park um, has uh, that building, if, if I'm right about it being Association Park, is at the corner of Olive and 20th, okay? So, and you're looking basically, let me make sure I get this right. Right now, the camera is kind of looking, oh, uh, I'd say uh, south, uh, southeast, basically. It's looking southeast. So I went to Google Maps and I actually went to Google Street View where you can sort of walk around, virtually walk around the streets of whatever city you want to. And I walked around and I found this building at the corner of Olive and 20th and look, this is the same building, especially with the distinctive two chimneys right here. Yeah, yeah. Same building, same side. Of, now, that, this side here, there's they had an, a, an extension on it back in 1920. That's gone now. Certainly things are going to change 100 years later. But this is the same building. That building overlooked the ballpark where these ballplayers were. It's still there. If you want to, you can walk right to it. So here's a photo taken, you know, 100 years after the Negro National League was founded. And it was founded just a couple of blocks away from this ballpark. So it's a great photo, but it's so much richer and the stories are so much more interesting now that we have this information. We know the date, we know um, the ballpark, um, we know the photographer and where he called home is now a shrine to Negro Leagues baseball. How fantastic is that? Very nice. What is at the exact location of the ballpark now? A park, a park with a with a little diamond on it that's facing a totally different direction than what this diamond faced. But there is a little park. It's it's still an open park. Yeah. Interesting. Any particularly famous ball players in this photograph? Yeah. So um, let me uh, go back here. Uh, Candy Jim Taylor. I think that's Candy Jim Taylor there. I I can't really recall. And uh, uh, this picture here is a guy named Drake who. Uh, um, let me see if I can get if I can get that information. Um, Bill Drake is standing at far left, and he had a wonderful quote that we pair with the photograph in the exhibit. And his quote was, um, and he, he this is in 1971 he was quoted, so he's an older man at this point. I don't feel bitter about it. It's just one of those things. It just didn't happen in my time, so I don't have anything to be bitter about. And that's him talking about playing segregated baseball. And I just thought that was a wonderful quote to pair 
with this photograph in our Featuring America's Pastime exhibit. Great stuff. 1920 Kansas City, the Monarchs against the St. Louis Giants. Right. All right, Tom, we've got one more artifact, and this is a jersey, uh, officially retired jersey for Hall of Famer Joe DiMaggio. And when you did some research here, you found something a little surprising. I did, and I want, I'm going to zoom through this because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. But um, back in uh, 1952, on, on opening day at Yankee Stadium, so uh, April 18, 1952, the Yankees retired Joe DiMaggio's number five jersey because uh, he had, after 51 World Series is over, he retired. So the next season, they um, had a ceremony on the field. And here's actually a picture of that ceremony. Here's Joe DiMaggio with a guy named Rowan Spraker, who was a representative of the Hall of Fame. He was there specifically to be at the ceremony because when DiMaggio's number was retired, he gave the uniform to the Hall of Fame. As a matter of fact, that was the tradition, hmm. was the, when, when they say you retire a uniform number, the real original phrase was you retired it to Cooperstown. You retired it to the Baseball Hall of Fame. It would only reside there, not on the back of any other Yankee ball player. And uh, that tradition is now gone. And so, but we have a number of final retired numbers because that tradition was uh, kept through much of the 60s, actually, and even into the early 70s. Hmm. Um, and so we sometimes still get get retired number jerseys. But this is the official one that came to us. Boy, it couldn't go be any more locked solid, uh, rock solid than that, because we have a representative there, Gary, I mean, excuse me, DiMaggio hands the jersey that was handed to him as, as the retired jersey. Uh, we know exactly what this is, right? Well, not really. We knew part of what it was, but by doing more research, we found something else about it. So um, I did some research because it's a 1951 jersey. You can see on the left sleeve here, the side, a part of the patch that was a patch worn in 1951 by all American League teams to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the American League as a major league. And um, so it seemed like a 1951 jersey. It seemed uh, like it was game use, but I was able to actually photo match it much like we do with the uh, Carpenter bat. I was doing it with jerseys and old photos of Joe DiMaggio in 1951. And I was able to actually find that he actually did really wear this jersey as well in various games. So that was good to know that so now it's got two things going for it. It's a game used jersey from 1951, his final major league season, and it's the, the jersey that they had the ceremony with. So that's two interesting stories. But then sometimes research happens when you're not doing any research. And I was watching a movie called Angels in the Outfield. Now, I know, Bruce, you're familiar with the 1994 remake of it, but you're probably familiar with the 19, uh, um, uh, 50, what is it, 1951 movie, I think it was. Uh, it came out end of 51 with Paul Douglas and Janet Lee, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the original Angels in the Outfield. And in that movie, there is this scene. So uh, bear with me. We have to load this little video up, and it's a short one, but this is about 50 minutes into the film. Hopefully, it's going to load here. If not, uh, here we go. There were newsreel interviews with baseball celebrities. Joe DiMaggio, Yankee center fielder. What do you think, Joe? If McGovern needs any extra angels, we'd be glad to give him a couple of ours. So that is a little scene. And this is a still from it. We can see Joe here. Um, there's actually uh, a, a lot of talk in newspapers about, oh, they're going to sign Joe to be in the film. Yeah, that's the entirety of his, his uh, cameo in the film. It's a good six to eight seconds, <laughs> that's it. But anyway, this is Joe at Yankee Stadium. And the first thing I did was I can see that he's wearing the, the same patch, but you know, they would wear different jerseys during the year. But uh, the first thing I wanna do is confirm that in fact, this is shot in 1951. Um, so he's wearing the right patch, but I also wanted to compare it to um, what Yankee Stadium looked like in 51. So I found this picture. Now this is a picture uh, that we know an exact date for, because this is a picture of, um, Oh, I, the, the name is escaping me right now. Uh, who um, pitcher who who had had two no hitters for the Yankees? Anyway, uh, this is a Allie Reynolds. Allie Reynolds. Thank you, Allie Reynolds. Very good. You're, Bruce jumps into the lead with with that uh, point there. <laughs> anyway, we can take a look at the scoreboards in the background. The score and that scoreboards with the um, advertisements and the this advertisement. Advertisements change on a yearly basis. They would sell new ads to new companies, uh, or they change an ad. So you can see here, 
Manhattan shirts, there's the Manhattan shirts in the movie, or Seagram's Seven Crown, right? That ad, this is, there it is, Seagram's over there. So um, this was definitely 1951 is when that little scene was shot for the movie. But furthermore, we look at the front of the jersey here and we can match certain things up. Now, uh, one thing, for example, is you can see the buttons are nicely uh, surrounded by pinstripes. That's not always the case. Um, but in this case, they are surrounded by it. And if you look closely, you can see that that is the case. Yeah. Um, also, the NY is in the exact same position relative to these pinstripes. What I'm not showing you here is further research where I looked at the positioning of the um, patch. But most important, quite frankly, because a lot of, hum a lot of uh, NYs are, are nicely um, symmetrical on the, the pinstripe pattern. But you can see on his, uh, his right sleeve, we, we see it on the left, his right uh, shoulder, how the pinstripes from the back side and the front side do not necessarily match up particularly well. That's a fairly unique pattern. And on the right side though, they actually match up quite nicely. You can see, they, it's almost like they go right over the shoulder. Oh. That's the case here. And you're, it, I'm sure this is too dark to see, but believe me, uh, the uh, way the pinstripes don't match is exactly what we see in this picture. This is in fact the same uniform that he is wearing in the movie, is also the one that was retired uh, opening day the next, the next year. Um, I wasn't intending to do any research, but I bumped into this and I said, you know what? I know we have a 1951 Dimaggio jersey. I wonder if this is the same one. What are the odds? Well, you figure out the odds once you do the research and, and they are in fact the same. And this uh, jersey is part of our second floor timeline exhibit uh, from the early 1950s. So no question that it is the one that it is supposed to be. Yeah, and Tom, even the five on the back matches up really nicely as well. Yeah. Tom, we have just a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Uh, we'll go rapid fire through a few questions. Please. Uh, first up, we have a question. Uh, they did not leave their name, but it's a good one. Is every artifact researched when you receive it or do you wait uh, when you choose to put it on display to do the research? Um, so the answer is actually both. We research it when it, when it comes in, when it's being offered. Um, we wanna understand what it is, what it is not as best we can. Um, and then whenever we use it, we re-research it because one, some time will have passed and so maybe I'll have a new tool or I'll have a new understanding or maybe someone else will do some research and that's it. They look at things differently than I do. I don't have the, I'm not the BL and end all, you know, so, so uh, we'll do that all the time. And there have been times when we've used artifacts in multiple exhibits and we research, we research them and then we re-research them multiple times. Whenever I'm gonna use an artifact, I'm gonna research it. I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna take a look at it each time, even if I know I did the research before. And there have been times when I've discovered something new. Very good. Dan Martin wants to know, any artifact that you've documented that turns out to be the opposite of your first impression on validity. So maybe you had an artifact, you were skeptical about it, and then you did the research and found, hey, this is legit. Yeah, I'll give a really good example. And I was thinking about including that in this, in, in this and there's so many wonderful artifact research stories and I didn't include it, but it has to do with another jersey. And real quickly, we had a jersey of Christy Matheson's on exhibit for a very long time, but it always kind of bugged me because it's blank on the front. And during his major league career, he never wore a jersey where there was no logo or no features on the front. This was a very plain nothing jersey. Uh, so whether it's pinstripes or an NY or whatever. So finally, um, I asked uh, somebody from collections, you know, can we take this off exhibit? I'd like to do some research on it. When I researched it, um, you know, it came in from a, like a second cousin, as I recall, or maybe a nephew, I can't remember, of Christy Matthewson's, and that checked out fine. Um, and we had thought for a long time, we were aware of the fact that it seemed weird. And so the uh, label that had probably been around since the 1950s, said, jersey worn by Christy Matheson during his sandlot days. Mm -hmm. And that was the explanation for why there was no logo on the front because I knew there should be. And, um, but I did some research that hadn't been done before. And that was, I looked at the logo, of the Spalding logo, because it was a Spalding made uh, jersey. And that logo changes over time. And I was able to date that logo to a certain swath of years. And that was not during his sandlot days. That was right during the heart of his 
heyday with the Giants in their first decade of the 20th century. So I wasn't feeling good about this. So I set it aside to do a little research um, later on, and then I got a phone call from a uh, wonderful woman named Sarah Degatano, who you know, Bruce, who used to work down in collections. And she called me and it was like an Edison, uh, not an Edison, uh, um, yeah, it was a, you know, when Edison did, the, did his uh, telephone thing, come, come now, I need to talk to you or whatever that story is about. It's probably apocryphal about inventing the telephone. Um, she called and she said, Tom, come down right now, Tom. I think I see something. Hmm. And she took, she brought me down and she said, on the front of this jersey, I think I see what used to be an NY, but you, it, you just sort of see a reverse shadow of where it used to be. And she pointed to me and it just jumped out. And I was really upset. Uh, I was happy because, oh my gosh, now it looks like this, this is from the, somehow they removed the NY. But I was very upset at myself, like, how did I miss this? I mean, it was crazy. So the, the style of the NY, everything, suddenly collapsed down to 1905. It had to be 1905, because we know what the jerseys look like, which is one of his greatest seasons. Suddenly, this object, which, which I had questioned as even being major league or even Sandlot, I just didn't even know what it was, suddenly became one of the coolest jerseys I could imagine. But I was very upset about this. So anyway, we put it back on exhibit because we wanted to, to tell this great story of, oh, this is from 1905. And when, you put it back, when we put it back on exhibit, you couldn't see the NY anymore. It had to do with the fact that it was under different lighting conditions. And I knew what I was looking for. I knew exactly where to see the NY and I couldn't find it. The light has to be just right. Mm -hmm. And um, so sometimes it's not, it's not just researching in old newspapers, et cetera. Sometimes you have to look at it, literally look at it differently to, to, to discover something about it. All right, Tom, last question. Glinda Parada wants to know, uh, does Bob Kendrick of the Negro Leagues Museum know about that St. Louis <laughs> Negro Leagues photo uh, about the photographer J.E. Miller? I think she wants to know if maybe you talked to Bob about it. Well, that's funny. That's awesome question because it's so funny that that's brought up. I don't know if Bob knows, but I know that Ray Doswell knows and Ray is the curator there because I called him about it hmm. and I actually I, I emailed him about it and um, uh, he was not aware of this. Um, and no, no, not because he didn't do a good job of researching. He, had, he hadn't really researched this. Listen, there's thousands of artifacts, I, countless artifacts I, that haven't been researched. But no, this is a new new scoop, for, first publicized today. So um, you guys are in on on a new fun discovery about uh, this uh, photographer and how his studios are where the Negro Leagues Museum. But they will know because I told I, I've already told Ray, so I'm sure he'll he'll tell Bob. Very good. Our program has been asked the expert researching an artifact. I want to thank Tom Sheever for joining us for the uh, last hour plus. A reminder that next week, next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern time, and that is coming up on October the 20th, uh, our special guest is going to be the winner of this year's Ford C. Frick Award, Ken Hawk Harrelson. Uh, so we will follow one colorful character, Tom Sheever, with another Hawk Harrelson. Oh, I'm no, I'm no Hawk. <laughs> uh, you dress better than he did back in the 60s. We'll no, no, no. Hawk. He got me beat there, too. We'll talk to Hawk about that and some other things as well. Again, that's coming up next Tuesday, October 20th at 2 p.m. Thanks, Tom. Great job. Appreciate you being with us. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for Ask the Expert from the Baseball Hall of Fame. Have a great day, everyone.